background about myself. Uh, I am, as I tell people, a recovering attorney. Uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, lived in Portland, uh, went to University of Oregon, first in my family to be blessed to go to college, uh, and then was very blessed to be able to continue on to Harvard Law School, and then chose Seattle as a place to be, uh, and I'm so glad I did, and had the chance to work at two different law firms, made partner at one, then one of my clients hired me as their general counsel, so I was there leading the legal department for two years when... I had a spiritual transformation. I was born Muslim, and I actually studied Islam and other religions in a comparative religions context in college. And in college, I chose Islam as my personal faith. I decided at that time, this is the truth for me. But as I tell people, I chose it at that time with my mind, and it hadn't really moved my heart. It wasn't until five years ago when I had this spiritual transformation that it actually moved my heart. And, and part of that was actually reading the Quran for the first time cover to cover in a language I knew. Because what I would do before, like many of you may understand this, is start, I was a Ramadan Muslim, essentially. I would, uh, during every Ramadan, I would start reading the Quran, because that's when I was practicing. I would start reading the Quran, get about halfway through, Ramadan would end, the book would close, until the next year when I would open it again, start from the beginning, and go that way. So that was sort of where I was. But this one Ramadan five years ago, I actually finally read the Quran cover to cover, and it shook me to my core. And it caused such a transformation in me and in my life, so much so that I left my legal career, I pursued knowledge and service as, as Islam commands us to do, I learned about Islam a lot more, and this all happened at the right time, at a time when we were seeing growing divisiveness in our country, at a time when Islamophobia was on the rise, as you heard in, in the session before, at a time when it was more important than ever for us to learn about each other, for us to learn a little bit about Islam, even some basics that a lot of people don't have. And again, many of you probably do, but I'm, I'm sure the majority of your congregations don't even have some of the basic fundamentals that we should have of any faith tradition. So that sort of, it all came at the right time, and I believe it was divinely inspired and guided to be able to sort of leave what I was doing in the legal world and really pursue this kind of bridge building, and that's what I've been really focused on since then. So I'm very honored and blessed to have this opportunity working with many of you in this room. Like, I look around and I am inspired by so many of the people in this room right now. And I've told some of you this before, and I haven't, let me say it now, which is that you all, are the people who give me hope, strength, and inspiration. Despite things like our mosque here, having its sign vandalized and attacked horribly, viciously, twice in less than a month. It was all of you who showed up and stood with us. It's all of you who, when we had Act for America, the hate group that was mentioned, the largest hate group in our state, show up and do a rally across the nation, including here in Seattle. It was many of you who stood up and said, we're not gonna stand for this. And it was faith leaders that went to businesses downtown and asked them to put up, we stand with our Muslim neighbors signs in their windows. And you joined us in standing as part of a large coalition that outnumbered the haters 10 to one to stand united and say Seattle stands with our Muslim neighbors. That was all of you. So thank you. Let's give all of you a round of applause. So that's, so I'm inspired by all of you, and it's so inspiring to see you all joining us here today for this important time, this critical time, and this opportunity that we have to truly, truly make a difference. So that tells you a little bit about my own journey, and also let me say that what I'm going to be talking about here, I already mentioned, it's a basic introduction, it is just a drop of water in the ocean of Islam. I myself am still a, a learner, I'm a seeker of knowledge, so I'm far from an expert, I'm not a scholar by any measure uh, in Islam, but the little bit that I've learned, I wanna sort of share with you. And I wanna really tell you how and why Islam inspires me to be sort of a better person, how it gives me the same way that Christianity does for Christians, the same way that uh, Judaism does for our Jewish sisters and brothers, the same way that anybody's faith tradition should do. It gives me that hope and optimism and strength to get through day to day. To day. And what I also want to, want to help convey to many of you in this room, because we're so inundated with all the negative, we're so inundated talking about what Islam is not and what Muslims don't believe, that we never get to actually talk about what Islam is and what Muslims actually believe. And that's part of what I hope to do here. So I, I say all of that, and I will make one additional disclaimer before I get into it. 
and that is that I, you already, I hope, have seen that I'm very passionate, <laughs> and I'm especially passionate about my faith. I hope all of you are passionate about your faith as well. I do not want anybody to mistake my passion, my sort of just love for Islam, that I want to share a little bit with you as any attempt on my part to try to proselytize, because that's not at all what it is. But I want to make sure, because sometimes I get so into it, I'm so excited and passionate, but please don't think that I'm trying to convert anybody. So that's that sort of thing. So let's start with the very basics. How many of you have heard of the five pillars of Islam? Okay, majority, pretty much everybody. Uh, who feels comfortable naming all five? Oh, oh, nobody. Oh, okay. I, I know people just don't want to raise their hands. They don't want to, they don't want me to come over and ask them, especially because I'm down here on the ground and I might do that. So fair enough, fair enough. We will go into them. We will talk about what each of them are. Uh, but just to, by point of reference, I'll just start by mentioning the five pillars now, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail about them. Uh, number one is the declaration of faith or Shahada. Uh, number two is the prayer. Number three is charity. No, I'm sorry. Number three is, uh, Fasting in the month of Ramadan, number four is charity, and number five is the pilgrimage uh, to, to Mecca. And we'll talk a little bit about each one of those. But what these five pillars are intended to do is really bring the divine into our mundane life. This is a way for us to connect to God every single day. And actually, when we can start talking about some of these, you will see that many of these things are similar to what Jews and Christians and people of other faith traditions do as well, like pray, for instance. But we'll go into that. So some very basic key words. Uh, again, this might be a little too basic for some of you, but let's just start with the fact that Allah, God, that is simply the Arabic term meaning God. You know, the same way that we say, you know, Dios in, Eng uh, in Spanish, for instance, or God in English, right? It's not a different God. We all share the same creator. You know, that's what monotheism is all about, is the fact that uh, there's only one God. We believe that as the Abrahamic faith traditions, that there's only one God. In Arabic, that word for that God is Allah. And this is why you hear, for instance, Christian Arabs in, in Arab lands also say Allah. And also say things like, inshallah, God willing, or Allahu Akbar, God is great. So this is, these are things that you hear because uh, Allah simply means God. The reason I will add, for you guys as faith leaders, I can go a little bit more advanced. I will say that the reason we say Allah instead of God, that actually Muslims prefer to use Allah instead of God, it's not to disconnect from, from our you know, other uh, uh, sisters and brothers here, but it's really because the word Allah, as you can see, is unique. You can't make it plural, you can't make it gender, uh, gender it, you know, add gender to it, uh, or, or anything else. Whereas the word God, you can say gods, you can say goddess, you can use it in a reference of like, you know, the, the, the god of music or the god of rap or whatever, right? You can't do that with the word Allah. That's why, because we want to maintain that uniqueness of God, of our creator, that's why we actually prefer to say Allah. And Islam is simply part of the monotheistic faith tradition. And we trace our roots back to Prophet Abraham. All Jews, Christians, and Muslims share that sort of common patriarch. And this is why I've done panels with some of my uh, Jewish and Christian sisters where we've called, called ourselves daughters of Abraham, because we are in a certain way. Uh, and the, the basic essence of Islam, the teaching of Islam, like the other faith traditions, is to love and worship the one true God alone and to love his creation and serve his creation. Worship the creator by serving his creation, right? And we'll get a little bit more into that. Now with Muslims, a uh, Muslim is simply somebody who follows Islam, okay? So that's the, the capital M as we understand it, followers of Islam. But here's the reality too. Muslim with a lowercase m, we use this because the word Muslim itself simply means somebody who submits their will to God. And by that definition, I call my Christian, and Jewish sisters and brothers, Muslim with a ca lower, lower case M as well. Because you are all, we're all following what God wants us to do, or trying to follow in those teachings, in those steps. I will also point out one sort of uh, a, a rhetorical distinction here for people, and that is that uh, Muslim versus Islamic. Can anybody identify the difference between those two? Anybody know? Okay, I'll. Ah, oh, we have one. John, let's hear it. Muslim refers to a person. Islam is the faith. What about Islamic? 
Well, we refer to the faith. That you, you, you hit on it, actually. So, so uh, we got Muslim, which is a, a person. But when you're describing things, so in the use of an adjective, when you say a, uh, when you're describing something, Muslim is to refer to a person. So you would say a Muslim lawyer, a Muslim doctor, a Muslim architect. Islamic refers to inanimate objects. You would say Islamic architecture, Islamic art, Islamic buildings. So that's a point that people often confuse. So it's good for all of you as faith leaders to know that. And in Islam, we believe actually in the very same prophets that many of you in this room read about, believe in, and try to follow. Here's a listing of some of the prophets. Uh, and, and we believe as Muslims that uh, not only did, uh, basically we believe in this continuity of message from prophets throughout the course of history. In fact, there's even a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he talks about the fact that there were 124,000 prophets sent to mankind over the course of history. We don't know their names. We know there's 25 mentioned in the Quran, and these are some of them. Uh, but essentially we're taught that they came because we as human beings kept getting it wrong. So God would send another person, and we'd get it wrong again, and another, you know, to different communities throughout the course of history. And the very point was to teach us that essential, basic message of the one true God and doing good. And we'll get more into that. But these prophets, these names, you're, you're familiar with a lot of them. And in the Arabic, some of the, the uh, words may sound different, the names may sound different. Like Jesus is Isa, peace be upon him, but it's the very same prophet. And if you read the Quran, you'll hear, you'll see these stories about all of these great prophets that we as Muslims uh, believe in. In fact, the Quran has this quote where God specifically tells us uh, to say that we have believed in God, in Allah, and what has been revealed to these other great prophets throughout the course of history, and specifically naming some of them that I think many of you here are familiar with. And you'll notice there that it also says we make no distinction between them. We are commanded to say that and accept all the prophets. We don't choose, pick and choose, and this one, that one, whatever. We don't. Uh, so, so that is sort of something that the Quran specifically commands us to do. And you'll also see from this, and I'll get to it when I get to, uh, talking about the Quran, but we also, or I should say, if you read the Quran, you'll see that the tone, the way the Quran is written, is unique. It's different from pretty much any other book you've read uh, in terms of religious scripture, because it's God directly talking to you. So this is why it's, it's a little jarring to some people when they first pick up the Quran and they start reading this. I know it was to me, right? When you start reading this and all of a sudden it's like God is literally talking to you right there in, in the very tone and language of the Quran itself. So as I said, we believe in sort of the continuity of messengers coming in throughout uh, uh, the, the course of history and the message, the message being that one basic message. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even described all the prophets throughout history as a brotherhood. Like they're all connected. And in fact, what he also said is that he, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him, are the closest because he said they're like this because they were essentially the last two prophets in this long chain that started with Adam, peace be upon him. So they're like kind of like the, you know, the younger kids in a big family. That's why he says they're so close. So, so that's, that's one thing. And this one message, again, is the very same thing that many of you as Jews, Christians, and people of other faith backgrounds even believe in. We also believe in the Quran, as I mentioned. Uh, and the Quran specifically was the revelation that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received over the course of 23 years. So it wasn't given all at once. It was given over the course of 23 years, and the revelation came down at different times under different circumstances. And this is why it is so important to know the context of certain verses. Because when contexts change, meanings change. And you cannot draw general rules from rules that are specific to limited contexts. And that's something important to recognize with the Quran as with any other book as well. And the Quran, is the, in, its, in its, uh, 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 the form that it was revealed in, it's in Arabic. That is the language of the Quran. We have multiple translations in multiple languages, including the English translation that we have there for you. But the Quran, the, the original Quran itself, it's in Arabic. And here's a really, really, thing, a really cool thing that I find just amazing. Uh, in the Quran, God tells us, that we sent down the Quran as a reminder and we shall preserve it. We being the royal we, God talking to us, telling us that he is going to preserve the Quran. 
guess what? 1,400 years later, we still have that Quran preserved in its original Arabic, exactly the same as we had 1,400 years ago. Not one word has changed. And if you destroyed every single Quran on earth today, if you burn them all down, tomorrow you can get a Muslim from China, a Muslim from Africa, and a Muslim from America and recreate the entire Quran because millions of people have memorized it in its entirety. And if you think about the fact that in 1,400 years, rivers even changed directions. And the Quran, not one word of it, has been changed in that time. But we don't believe just in the Quran. We also believe in other books that were sent to other great prophets. Because as, as we said, we believe in these other prophets. And we know that God gave them revelation. And they came down to teach us the guidance. And the books specifically, the other books that are sent by God to different prophets that we believe in as Muslims include the Torah for Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, the Psalms with Prophet David, peace be upon him, the Injil with Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and the Quran on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe in all of them. So now getting to the actual pillars. The first one I mentioned is the Declaration of Faith, the Shahada. And this this is simply saying that there is no God but Allah, the one cre creator God of all of us, and accepting that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Now here's the thing about that statement of faith, that declaration of faith. When you say and believe in that, that alone makes you Muslim. That's all you gotta do. There's no special ritual or formal ceremony you have to go through. You, that's all you gotta recite is that shahada, that declaration of faith, that's it. And when you believe in that, and when you say that Prophet uh, Muhammad is God's messenger, there's two purposes for that. The first one is to recognize that he is just a messenger, just a prophet. He is not, you know, to not uh, uh, raise him to a level of a divine being in any way, right? To make sure we recognize who he actually is. And the second role, the second aspect that's really cool about this declaration of faith is by making that statement and believing in it, you're not just believing in Muhammad, you are believing in all the prophets, including Moses, including David, including Abraham, including, you know, all of them. Peace be upon them all. So that declaration of faith is actually very I inclusive, even though it specifically only mentions Muhammad in it. Peace be upon him. Pillar number two is the prayer. Now, we're all familiar as faith leaders, we're all familiar with the prayer. You know, the prayer is an important part of our practice as people of faith. And in Islam, the prayer like the supplication, like we did with Rabbi Aaron Meyer starting us off in the beginning of, of this conference, uh, that kind of prayer we are encouraged to do all the time and ask God for what we want and need in life and have that personal connection with God. So this is, this is supplication, but we also have our formal prayer in Islam. This is the, the prayer that I'm sure many of you have seen. Many of you may have even participated in this prayer with us. And if you haven't seen it before, you will get plenty of chances to do so during this conference because we are at a mosque. So you will see us hear the call to prayer and have to take a break uh, throughout the day for the various five daily prayers. We had the early morning one, early in the morning, 6.45 a.m., uh, and we will have the next one at about 12.30. And there will be three more after that. So you'll get to experience it all because we are in a mosque. And this is a picture of Christian Muslims, I'm sorry, uh, Muslims in China, that's what I meant, Chinese Muslims, uh, praying. And in our formal prayer, we have movements, certain sort of movements that we do as part of that prayer. And one thing that's so amazing and beautiful about the prayer when you do it in congregation, when you do it in a group like at a mosque or somewhere else, is everybody lines up shoulder to shoulder next to each other. It doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your racial background, your you know, class, you could be king or pauper and you're lined up right next to each other equal before God, exactly as God views us, you know, in terms of equality uh, of human beings. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But this prayer also has other movements. We have the bowing movement like this. You'll have the sitting down movement. You'll have uh, the, uh, the uh, prostration as well. And what I will say is these, these sort of movements, you know, think about it like yoga, right? Uh, they, they are supposed to help us spiritually, physically, and also just connect us to God. And when you are in this, this prostration mode, you are in your most humble position possible. Somebody could know nothing about Islam, and if they see somebody prostrated, 
they will recognize that as a sign of submission. And that is the point. It's supposed to teach us humility and bring us close to God. And God tells us that in that position, we are closest to him. That God is like closer than our jugular vein. And in that position, we have sort of the most access to him because we are fully cognizant of who we are down in sort of our humble selves and how great God is. And in fact, when you are in that position, you are actually saying God is the, the highest. You're in your lowest position. We put something that we value so much, our intellect, our mind, our forehead, down on the floor and submit our will to God, submit ourselves to God in that, in that uh, prostration movement. And at that point, we recognize that God is so high, so great. And when we, when we are bowing like this, when we're in our weakest position, because if someone were to come behind me and push me, I would fall over. You know, you're in your weakest position as a human being in that position. And when we're in that weakest position, we recognize God being the source of all strength. We recognize him as the strongest, the source of all strength, the greatest in that sense. So it's really this beautiful symbolism that you see throughout and then after this, we close every prayer by sending peace blessings to everybody on our right and everything on our left, everybody and everything on our left. So that's the formal prayer. And in fact, when we have our uh, uh, people of the faith traditions learn a little bit about this prayer and actually learn the meaning of what we say and do in the prayer, we have had Christian, Jewish, and other friends join us in prayer because the, the idea, recognizing God's greatness, humbling ourselves to him, uh, wanting to take a moment to remember God in our busy daily lives, that's something that other people can relate to as well. And you know, some people ask me, isn't it tough? Like, isn't it a challenge to stop your day five times a day and pray? Like, doesn't that get like interruptive of your day? And I say, yes, and that's the point, right? <laughs> We get so caught up in life that we forget what the, our true priorities are. And Islam teaches us what our true priorities are. And that's why the five daily prayers are intended to constantly remind us of that. Constantly put our priorities forward and, and get us to take a break so that we could actually uh, sort of recognize God. And find a little bit of meditation moments. I think we all can benefit from some personal reflection, meditation in these uh, very, very hectic times. The next pillar is charity. Now charity, there's, there's two, two aspects of charity that I wanna mention. The first one is what this formal pillar is. This formal pillar refers to like the almsgiving and it is a mandatory 2.5% uh, amount that every Muslim has to give on their savings. That is a bare minimum. And that's not even considered charity in the real sense. That is considered the right of the poor over you. That is considered a way for you to purify your wealth. So it's not, so when, when I give in my zakat, in that kind of charity, I'm not doing the person that I give any favors. They are doing me a favor by allowing me to purify my wealth, by allowing me to fulfill my obligation to God, so I should be thanking them, not the other way around. And then we, of course, have the general concept of charity, sadaqah, which is different from zakat. So sadaqah, that general charity, is highly encouraged in the Quran, throughout the Quran. So we should be giving as much as possible to help our fellow human beings in need. Because again, that's one of the basic messages that Islam teaches, which is to, you know, as I said before, worship the creator by serving his creation, by helping our fellow human beings. And this is something that's not just in Islam, obviously. This is the same belief that our Jewish and Christian uh, sisters and brothers also believe in. In fact, we have examples of both Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, talking about the fact that for a wealthy person to get to heaven, it's like, you know, a camel going through the, the, uh, the needle, what do they call that, needle point? The eye of a needle, there you go, the eye of a needle. Muhammad and Jesus, peace be upon them, both said that. And it's because this, this sort of uh, 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 teaching for us to give Give, give, give. And in fact, we can't just give the things we don't want. We can't just give the things we would have thrown out anyways. Right? That, we can't do that and say, hey, there's my charity. No. God teaches us that righteousness is giving of what you love. Giving of what you yourself want. That is true righteousness according to the Quran. So this is an important part, again, of, of all of our faith traditions. Then we have four, fourth pillar. This is uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan. And fasting has two aspects to it. Actually, let me ask, how many of you have participated in an interfaith iftar or breaking of the fast together? 
Okay, many of you. That's great. That's wonderful to see. And uh, for the people who are here local, you're all invited and welcome to join us here at MAPS. Every year we do one large interfaith iftar, and it's an opportunity to bring the community, to community together. We fill up this whole place and break bread together, breaking the fast together. And the fast is from dawn to sunset. It's a long fast during the summer months, I will tell you that. You know, 17, 18 hours. It's a real struggle. And there are two aspects to the fast. One is the external. That's what many people see and maybe even complain about, which is refraining from food or drink or intimate relations from dawn to sunset. But there's also an internal aspect to it. And in reality, that internal aspect is a lot harder than the external. That internal is you're not supposed to say bad words. You're not supposed to gossip. You're not supposed to get angry even or react in anger. You're not supposed to backbite, slander. Those kinds of things, to refrain from all of that is really, really a challenge. And part of what, uh, what the fast does is it prepares us for that kind of spiritual discipline that we need throughout life. And Ramadan is essentially like our, you know, like super extreme workout time that is supposed to strengthen us spiritually to deal with the rest of the year. And I will tell you something else. As difficult as Ramadan is, and it is, it is difficult, no doubt about it, as difficult as, as it is, if you talk to many practicing Muslims, like myself, they will tell you that their favorite month of the year, their favorite time of the year is Ramadan. It is an amazing, beautiful time. And that sense of community and unity and peace with yourself and connection with God, that is sort of unmatched. So Ramadan really, really is a beautiful blessing, beautiful time. And I will also add that this fast, just like with the prayer, we also have examples in the Bible of other prophets, great prophets, like Moses, you know, like Jesus, peace be upon them both, also fasting at various times. You know, I think the Bible talks about them fasting for 40 days. We as Muslims are required to for 30 days during the month of Ramadan. But then there are other days that are highly recommended. So maybe it adds up to about the same, roughly 40 days. <laughs> Or maybe we get a little bit easier, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the fifth and final pillar is the Hajj, the pilgrimage. How many of you have seen this? Okay. Have you guys seen this in action? Like people circling this? Yeah? Okay. So it's, it, this spiritual pilgrimage is one of the spiritual highs for a Muslim. I was blessed to be able to go with my parents, and it was so moving, so amazing, and it's one of the largest human gatherings in the world, and it happens every year. Over two million people get together during a 10-day time frame to perform this pilgrimage. And this pilgrimage can be done other times too, but it's a lower form of pilgrimage. The high, the, the obligatory one is this one that is called the Hajj. The lower form is the Umrah, the one you can do anytime. But during the Hajj, I will tell you, it is so busy, so hectic, so like amazing. You know, and it's really a time to come together with people from all over the world. Again, all kinds of racial backgrounds, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds, national origin backgrounds. Everybody is mixed together. Doesn't matter your class, race, uh, gender, you are all mixed together. And the idea is that's what we're like, we're going to be like before God. And the reality too is that when we go to this pilgrimage, when we are ready to perform this, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to go and just hop on a plane and go over. I mean, obviously there's the, the technical aspect of a visa and everything else, but there's the spiritual aspects of things you have to do before you're ever even allowed to go on this Hajj from a religious perspective. And those are things like seeking forgiveness of everybody you wronged. Let me tell you, sitting down and trying to make a list from kindergarten to, you know, uh, <laughs> to, to the point that I went of everybody that I wronged and having to go through that process of seeking forgiveness and making sure that all your debts are paid. You can't have any debts when you go on the pilgrimage. All of these things are ways to remind us of death. That's essentially what you're preparing for. And even when you're on the pilgrimage, you'll see like the men wearing only two pieces of white cloth. Those two pieces of white cloth alone is all the men wear, and those two pieces of white cloth are what you get buried in as a Muslim when you die. And the idea, again, is to remind you of death and prepare you for death. Not in, not in a, a, you know, a horrible way, but to really help you purify yourself in this world and come back from this pil pilgrimage a changed person. Come back and do all the good you can do, because that's what God wants us to do. So it's really, really powerful and amazing uh, of an experience. And just to point out, that Kaaba, that uh, cube in the center there, that building, 
Muslims do not worship that block, that building. No, it is just in this direction that we pray, and we pray and worship God. But, but this is the direction that brings people from all over the world focus in one direction. That's, that's why we all use this as sort of the, the point of prayer uh, uh, in that. And I'll also point out that this building, the Kaaba, was actually not built by Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was built by Abraham, peace be upon him, with his son Ishmael, his second son. So this, this is, and when you go on the pilgrimage, the rituals you perform, they're not following Muhammad's footsteps necessarily, although he did them, but it's really honoring and recognizing Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, and a woman, his wife, Hagar. Millions of people from around the world, including kings, including the richest people in the world who've gone on this pilgrimage, they follow in the footsteps of a woman and honor and recognize a woman. That is really amazing, I think. And we'll get more into uh, talking about women as well. So we talked about the five pillars, that we also have six beliefs, six articles of faith. And these are things that I've kind of touched on already, so I won't spend much time on it. Uh, Muslims believe in God, obviously, in the angels. Uh, we believe that uh, the angels actually record all of our deeds, good and bad, word and action. Uh, and these, this book, this book of our deeds, this record of our deeds will be presented to us on Judgment Day. And we will be judged by the contents of that book. So this, this is the belief in the angels, belief in God's revealed books. I mentioned the Quran, Torah, Injil, Psalms. Belief in all the prophets and messengers of God. Uh, belief in the day of judgment. I mentioned our book. We will be presented with it. And God does this, has us go through this experience of life with all of these uh, deeds recorded. So on judgment day, when we get handed our book and we look at it and we see all the good or the bad that we did, we as human beings will understand why we are ending up where we are in the hereafter. That's the whole point of it. God already knows where we're going to end up. But this experience is for our benefit. So we understand why we are where we are. And we as Muslims also believe in something called qadr, which is predestination or God being in full control of everything. As I mentioned, God already knows where we're going to end up even. So some people say, well, why are we even doing this thing called life? Well, it's really, again, for us to understand. We know God is ultimately in control. And that's why you will see Muslims, even when they're going through a lot of difficulties, when they've lost people they love, when they're facing all kinds of hardships, they'll say it's in God's hands. It's in God's control. Because we know God has ultimate control. And we also recognize that God is ultimately in control, and we as human beings have limited free will, and we are judged by what we have free will over, by the things that we can actually choose. So if we talk about things that you have no control over, like your, like your uh, race, you know, like your parents. Those are things you can't control. You will not be judged for anything that you cannot control. We are only judged for what we make a choice about. And this is why there can be no compulsion in religion. This is why the Quran is very explicit and clear about this, that you have to have the choice to be a Muslim. You have to have a choice to pray five times a day or fast. If it is forced upon you, then that choice is taken away from you and the whole test of faith does not make sense then. You will not be judged for something you cannot choose over. So this is why the Quran explicitly tells us, let there be no compulsion in religion. That we have, and, and there's another uh, verse that I love in the Quran that says, to me is my religion and to you is, is yours. Right? This is something that is recognized in the Quran. And with that stand for truth, this is one of the principles in Islam that is so important. You know, God tells us that the truth is clear. Let people decide for themselves. And we as Muslims are commanded to, just like our Jewish sisters and brothers, just like our Christian sisters and brothers, just like many other people, moral human beings, we are commanded to speak truth and be honest. This is an aspect of our faith that is an important principle, standing for truth in everything, even when it means standing up to people who are in positions of power and the truth may hurt us personally. This is a commandment that we have. And then spreading peace. You know, the idea of peace, finding comfort, finding joy and happiness in something. This is why this image of coffee, although I think that might be hot chocolate, but coffee gives me peace. <laughs> might not seem like it, but it does. <laughs> So the same way that, that coffee or hot chocolate gives us that source of comfort and peace, this is what we as Muslims are commanded to do. We are commanded to spread peace. That's why every single prayer that Muslims pray, 
Every single prayer ends with wishing peace to the right and the left. This is why every single person that you greet, we say, Assalamu alaikum, which means? And the response is? There you go. So you guys already know this. So this is a greeting that we are commanded to say to people. This is a part of what Islam teaches us. And the word Islam itself, the root, because Arabic is, is a bunch of roots, the three-letter root for Islam is the very same one as peace. It's also the same as submission. And the idea is that you achieve peace within yourself and with the people around you. You achieve that harmony with people around you through submitting your will to God, through doing what God actually wants us to do, following the path of righteousness. And then, similar to Judaism, Christianity, and other faith traditions throughout the world, we have this idea of sort of goodness, of moral values that the faith tradition is supposed to teach us, a uh, sense of purity. And this is why you'll find things like halal, which is uh, making sure that any kind of uh, sacrifice or any kind of uh, uh, food that you eat is pure, the same way that our Jewish sisters and brothers who, who are practicing may follow kosher. It's the same idea of purification. And these teachings of purity are such an important part of our faith tradition. And part of this purity is also modesty. And I've said this before, that there are two forms of freedom. A lot of times here in the West, we focus on our freedom to do things. Like, I want to have the freedom to do this and that and that. We hardly ever talk about freedom from things, right? We don't talk often enough about freedom. Like, you have the right, you have the freedom to go, you know, use drugs. But guess what? you become enslaved by your addictions. And part of what Islam tries to teach us is to free ourselves from everything. And by submitting to the one true God alone, you are actually then free from the chains of that the humans face all around us. The chains of addiction, the chains of wanting to please other people, the chains of all of these chains, all of these things that we as human beings in this world face constantly. It is a source of empowerment and freedom to break all those shackles and really submit yourself to the one true creator alone. Uh, respect for humanity, all of humanity. This is a central teaching of Islam. Uh, and I will just sort of point out that this, you know, Islam is a faith tradition of over 1.6 billion people in the world. And a lot of times people think of Islam or Muslim, uh, the Muslim world as a monolith. And we talked about that as one of the stereotypes. When in reality, there are almost 50 Muslim-majority countries. There are 80 countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So there's so much diversity within the Muslim world, right? And part of the diversity, part of the beautiful diversity is the different backgrounds of people who come together and a recognition that we're supposed to respect each other, regardless of backgrounds. And specifically with the worldwide Muslim population, a lot of times people have a stereotype about what a Muslim looks like, when in reality, sort of um, uh, uh, Arab Muslims are 20% or less of the Muslim po worldwide population. You have roughly the same amount or more of Muslims in, in China than you do in Saudi Arabia. Indonesia is the country with the greatest population of Muslims. And I think it's India and Pakistan, the Muslim population of those two countries alone is greater than the Muslim population of all the Middle East combined. So, and, and here in America too, we have some great diversity among the American Muslim population. And if you see this chart, I don't know if you can see it very well, this is a dated chart a little bit too, it's 2008, but it gives you a sense of Muslims and their breakdown, white, African American, Hispanic, Asian, or other, uh, and then other faith uh, uh, groups as well. And this kind of reflects how American Muslims are actually a microcosm of the diversity of the worldwide Muslim population. And it's really beautiful and amazing. Uh, to see this. And of course, we know that American Muslims have been part of this country since before Christopher Columbus even. You know, as, as I, I think Madiha mentioned earlier, or somebody else, uh, up to 30% of slaves brought from Africa were Muslim, right? And Muslims have been part of our country, and we see it in sort of sports icons that we all celebrate too, like Muhammad Ali, or civil rights activists like Malcolm X, or, you know, athletes like Ittihad Muhammad, who just won, you know, medals for Team USA with her fencing, and now they have a Barbie of her, which is really cool with the hijab. But anyways, <laughs> the little things. Uh, so these are the kinds of diversity. And what Islam specifically teaches us and tells us, the Quran tells us, oh mankind, we, God, created you from a single pair of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you can get to know each other, not to despise each other. 
our point, the diversity. God commanded that diversity for us to get to know each other and learn about each other and do good to each other, to serve each other. This, and God even tells us that the most honored of us is not the one who's the richest, not the one who's, you know, a certain color or anything else. It's really the one who's the most righteous. And this righteousness is doing good, giving in charity, serving others. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Also part of this concept of uh, uh, racial equity, let's say, this is from the sermon, the final sermon that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave to his uh, followers. And he said specifically at that time, 1400 years ago, in 7th century Arabia, he basically told them at that time that all mankind is from Adam and Eve, and there's no superiority of race. Imagine if 1400 years ago we had implemented that teaching and we didn't have to struggle with the very same issues that we have today with racism in this country and around the world. We also have this uh, very strong aspect of justice in Islam, just like in Judaism, for instance, just like in Christianity and other faith traditions as well. And this is a verse from the Quran that's actually posted at Harvard Law School's faculty library. Um, and it's, it's amazing because it's one of the greatest manifest, it's posted as one of the greatest manifestations of justice in the world. And we are specifically commanded to stand firmly for justice, even against ourselves or our family or kin or anybody else. This commandment of justice is such an central, integral part of what Islam teaches us and commands us as Muslims to follow. Uh, this, uh, you, you can't see the picture very well, but this is uh, a group of American Muslims, uh, myself and others, uh, attending the Women's March. And that was sort of one aspect of coming together to stand for justice, you know, justice for gender and, and other issues that we uh, uh, stood for. Empowerment of women. This is actually um, one of the areas that is most often misunderstood, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories and misinformation out there about what Islam teaches about women. Let me tell all of you that I personally, when I chose Islam in college, as I mentioned, I chose it then as my faith with my mind, and then later it moved my heart. Back in college, one of the main reasons that I personally chose Islam over other faith traditions for myself was because of the empowerment of Islam, uh, the empowerment of women that Islam provides. And this is just one quote from Prophet Muhammad saying, the best of you are those who are best to women. And he taught so many other aspects. And this is, you know, this is related to justice, essentially. Justice for women. There's a verse in the Quran that specifically says that women have rights over you to the men, uh, just like men have rights over women. It's a balance of rights and responsibilities in Islam. And we also have so many other verses in the Quran talking about men and women being sort of garments to each other to protect and, and help each other. Prophet Muhammad describing men and women as committed helpers to each other or twin halves of each other. We have quotes about how the more somebody's faith increases, the better their treatment will be of women. We have all of these teachings from Prophet Muhammad and we also have his own practice. How he, in 7th century Arabia, at a time when before Islam, uh, female infanticide was common, and Islam came and changed that, and God specifically prohibited that in the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, what he did is actually elevate the status of women by he himself going to, his, to the women in his life, seeking advice from them, doing work at home that is considered women's work by some, this is Prophet Muhammad himself. Even when he became the, sort of the head, the, the ruler of the Muslim community, he was still doing these kinds of things. And he said things like, you know, somebody who educates and raises four girls, he didn't say boys, four girls, four daughters, that can be their pathway to paradise. And somebody came up to him and was like, I only have three girls, what about me? And he was like, even you. If you raise your daughters well, if you educate them, that can be your pathway to paradise. He also said paradise lies at the feet of the mother. He didn't say father, he said mother. He also specifically, when somebody came up to him and asked, you know, who should I show the most love and, and respect and, and care to, he said your mother. And the guy's like, okay, who next? He's like, your mother. He's like, okay, who next? He's like, your mother. He's like, well, okay, who next? And then he's like, finally, he said, your father. And as one uh, religious leader said, uh, if this was the Olympics, the mother would get the gold, silver, and bronze, and the father would sadly walk away with maybe a consolation prize. <laughs> you 
the, the emphasis that he put on women and elevating them was because of the status and how they were facing challenges, misogyny, patriarchy before Islam. And Islam actually introduced a package of women's rights. And I will point out some of these, whether it's uh, the right to own your own property, the right to inheritance. 1,400 years ago, these rights were granted through the package that uh, Islam brought through the Quranic teachings. You know, we in the Western world had to fight through Married Property Women's Acts to even be recognized as an independent woman once you get married, to even be able to enter into a contract or own property in your own name. Because what would happen in the West uh, before these acts was that when you married, all your property became part of your husband's. Islam, 1400 years ago, conveyed a completely different picture, completely different paradigm. And it also commanded that any, any payments, a, a dowry is, is required of a man when they marry a woman, and in the past, that would go to the father. Islam said, no, 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 that belongs to the girl. That belongs to the bride, the, the, the girl herself. That's her independent property. There are so many aspects of this, and this is why historically we have had in Islamic history female scholars, enormous, tremendous female scholars that taught men and women. We have had female uh, uh, leaders uh, sort of in, in the marketplace as business owners, as entrepreneurs, uh, they've been active throughout history, and even today, American Muslim women are some of the most highly educated religious uh, community in our country. And you have examples of American Muslim doctors, lawyers, uh, entrepreneurs, and, and every other category that you can think of. And the education, a lot of people don't know, again, I mentioned the right to education that Islam brought for women specifically, um, the first university in the world was built by a Muslim woman. Another fact that is often overlooked, just like the fact that several Muslim-majority countries, I think about a dozen, have had female heads of state, even women wearing hijab. We have yet to see that here in our own country. Kindness, another important theme in Islam. And in fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even taught us that kindness, that even a smile is an act of charity. That being kind to people, this is a mark of faith. This is a way that we are actually getting rewarded every single deed that's being recorded. Those acts of kindness, just like the teachings of my Christian sisters and brothers, like what Jesus, peace be upon him, himself taught and embodied love, just like Judaism and what it teaches. You know, loving kindness being a concept in Judaism, this is also the case in Islam. And I was honored to be on a panel with some of my uh, Jewish sisters and brothers talking about the concept of loving kindness both in Judaism and in Islam. We have so much in common. Service to others. I've said this already a few times, uh, but the only thing I'll point out here is in addition to general service to all in need, there's also a specific uh, elevated sort of uh, service uh, requirement on us to the elderly, especially our parents. <coughs> We're not even allowed, the Quran specifically tells, it makes a commandment that I have to say is so hard to do. My brother is here too, uh, and he can attest to it because we all struggle with this. But we're not even allowed to say, uff, to our parents. Like if your mom says, you know, go pick up your room or whatever, clean your room, you can't even be like, ugh. <laughs> the Quran literally commands us that we cannot even do that. That's how strong the command of kindness to parents is. And it's not just to human beings, it's to all creation. The environment, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, talked about the environment and caring for the environment. Talked about uh, a animals as well. In fact, there's a story of, of a, um, I, I can say this, uh, a prostitute uh, who actually, uh, well, she was not Muslim, she was a prostitute and she actually saw a dog in the you know, middle of Arabia, you can imagine how hot it is, this dog was dying of thirst essentially. And this prostitute, this woman, she saw that dog had mercy and compassion in her heart for that dog. She went to a well, used her shoe to get that dog water. And the story tells us that because of that act of kindness, that act of mercy and compassion, that she would be granted paradise. Those are the kinds of things that Islam actually teaches us about respecting all creation. And we also have forgiveness. Forgiveness is such an important theme in Islam. And it is an important aspect, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, specifically taught us to show love and forgiveness and kindness even to the people who do us wrong. And the Quran commands us to say, by saying, repel evil with good. And then here's the beautiful thing. God even says that when you do that, when you follow that commandment of repelling evil with good, guess what? Your devoted enemy 
could become your friend. It's so beautiful. And we have seen this with examples of Muslims here in America actually following what Islam practice, uh, teaches us by, for instance, the, the Muslim father uh, who uh, forgave the killer of his uh, son. His son was killed. Uh, he was a pizza delivery driver, a Muslim pizza delivery driver. And this man forgave the man who killed his son. And when he did so in the name of Islam, he said, this is the spirit of Islam. He even told the, the man, he, told, he even told the killer of his son, he specifically said to him that God will not forgive people for their wrongs to other human beings until they are forgiven here on earth. So I want to forgive you because that's what my faith teaches me. And this other picture here of Rice uh, Bouillon, some of you may have heard of him. He was shot in the face in an anti-Muslim hate crime. He was shot in the face and the person who, who shot him, Rice went to bat. Not only did he forgive him, but he went to bat for him. He went and fought to try to avoid having the death penalty imposed on that man. And he said he did it in the name of Islam because he was actually following what Islam teaches. And this mother, Rukia, who forgave the killer of her son, and in doing so, specifically even said that I don't hate you. That is not our way. That's not what my faith teaches me. This is something that people of faith of all backgrounds can understand and recognize. This is the beauty and power of faith, is to elevate us above our human instincts, our human desires for vengeance sometimes, and really bring us to what God seeks us to do, which is show that love and forgiveness and kindness to our fellow human beings. And this struggle to do good, it is not easy. How many of you think you could forgive somebody who kills a family member of yours? I know that would be a really hard thing for me to do. And because that's not easy, that is actually what jihad is. That struggle to do good, that struggle to actually follow these teachings. And the same thing is true about uh, Jesus' teachings, peace be upon him, and the teachings of Moses, peace be upon him. Following those teachings of our great prophets and leaders is not easy. But to do that, that is that spiritual struggle that we have as human beings. And that, as Prophet Muhammad specifically said, is the greatest jihad, to overcome the weakness and evil and desires and ego within ourselves and do what God actually wants us to do, or speak truth to, to power as another form that he described. And this, there's also a physical component to jihad, but that physical component is extremely limited. There are only certain circumstances in which you can engage in that kind of physical confrontation. And those include defense of self, defense of others, or to prevent religious persecution to be able to achieve religious freedom for all. Those are the limited situations in which you can actually engage in physical confrontation. And Prophet Muhammad himself even taught us that if you are cruel or harsh to a non-Muslim minority living in a Muslim land, that Prophet Muhammad then will testify against you on the day of judgment. Because that is not what he taught. And there was a conference of religious leaders in, in Marrakesh, Morocco, where people were, came together, religious scholars around the, the world came together a few years ago to talk about how to actually implement these covenants that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually imposed on Muslims. Like this covenant that he had with a Christian monk community where he specifically told them that I will protect you. And he put a commandment on Muslims all over the world to do so till the end of time protect and, and, and preserve the religious freedom of other people. And this is why throughout Islamic history, you actually had Islamic rulers even pay to preserve churches or rebuild churches and synagogues and temples. This is not stuff you often hear about. So quickly to overview what we just talked about, we talked about uh, the Islam, the core beliefs, the belief in sort of one message, many messengers sharing that one message, and certain Islamic teachings essentially to do good, just like our other faith traditions teach us. All of this that we just talked about, guess what? Believe it or not, you were all just exposed to Sharia. <laughs> so Sharia, the big loaded term that is often used uh, as a way to demonize Islam and Muslims in our country. Sharia simply means Islamic teachings. So everything I talked about, that is Sharia. And linguistically, what Sharia means is a pathway to water. Like, just like an animal can be thirsty and they want to get water, we as human beings are spiritually thirsty. And Sharia provides us that path to water, that path to fulfillment, religious, spiritual fulfillment. Just like we get that fulfillment in sort of the, uh, the teachings of God through uh, other prophets as well, through other faith traditions as well. So, 
one of the most important things to do is to connect with actual you know, Muslim neighbors. Because a lot of the misinformation out there is a result of people not having the personal connections with each other, not having sort of experience actually with people who practice their faith and relying only on sort of media imagery that is negative uh, by studies. You know, over 80% of the coverage of Islam and Muslims in our country is negative and in fact, uh, even defamatory. The New York Times alone which is a relatively liberal paper, over the course of 25 years, there was a study done that the New York Times portrayed Islam and Muslims worse than cancer and cocaine. That's how bad we're talking about. So it's no, uh, I'm not surprised to see all the misinformation and the fear and uh, 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 the, the, all the concerns that we hear around us. But that's why we're all coming together. And that's why I wanted to make sure I present sort of what Islam actually teaches so all of you as faith leaders can be equipped to respond to a lot of these common misconceptions and tropes and other things that we're gonna talk about and talk specifically about how to do so in the, in the future sessions.